welcome to lecture 12 of the course. Um, we had spent most of the previous lecture discussing um, what are the um, desirable properties of this duality transform, right. Just to recap, <coughs> so we are trying to solve this problem of intersection of half planes, okay. And somehow we wanted to use our previous prior knowledge of constructing convex hulls uh, in two dimensions. Uh, so, we just hypothesized that there is this duality mapping D, which maps points to lines and maps lines to points, uh, such that uh, these properties are satisfied. That is, it is self inverse, it is 1 is to 1 and uh, there is this thing called incidence property that if a point P is incident on line L, then the dual of line L which is a point is incident on the dual of the point P which is a line. And then uh, from, from that, uh, the one of the consequences is that if L 1 and L 2 pass through a point P in the primal space, then the dual of these lines which are points okay, will lie on the line that is the dual of the that intersection point okay. that is that follows from the previous property. And then there is another important this orientation property which is calling the above below property that if a point P is above L then the dual of the line will be below the dual of the point. Right. So, and using these properties uh, 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 so, I could show you that there is a close and intimate connection between the problem of uh, uh, computing the intersection of uh, this downward half planes, okay, not, not the entire set. We, we partitioned the set of half planes into downward and upward. So, the downward uh, intersection of downward half planes it has a one to one correspondence with the lower hull of the dual of those lines describing the half planes. Right. So, this is where we stopped last time. Uh, so, everything was fine except that uh, there is I, I did not give you any concrete examples of such a duality function. Okay. So, so let me do that today. The, the kind of duality function that you know we, there, there are a number of such duality functions that satisfies the kind the properties that we mentioned. Uh, the one that I will be picking up you know has some special significance which we will see again in the course of this lecture. Um, so, what we will do is the following. So, uh, the point again is a is a pair of coordinates right. So, a point P, point P is some kind of coordinates you know let us say x prime y prime. Okay, and the line uh, is specified in the slope intercept form. So, it is the, the slope and the y intercept, right. Now, d's of p, I am defining as x prime y prime is map to uh, okay actually let me change the notation so that there is no confusion later on i will let me use a b instead of x prime y prime because normally you use the parametric equations in x and y right so let me change that to a and b so a b will be mapped to this line l given by y equal to 2 a x minus p. In other words, this is my m okay, and minus b is equal to c. and vice versa that uh, 
y d's of l given by y equal to 2 a x minus b okay, will be mapped to the point a b. So, this by definition becomes a self inverse. Let us try to verify at least. So, self inverse property is verified by the way I have defined it. So, let us try to verify the incidence property. So, incidence property. Suppose P lies on L. Okay. So, L is my parameter equation m x plus c. Okay. And this is given by a b. So, it satisfies that which means that it this a b must satisfy this equation. right? So, uh, implies um, Oh, just a moment. What am I saying? Just, 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 just one moment. Just one. What am I saying? Um, right. So that was the confusion, right? I missed that y, so, which means that implies p is equal to. Um, A x. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. What am I saying? Um, a m plus c, right? Okay. Now, what is the dual of the point? That is the line given by. y equal to 2 a x minus c sorry uh, minus b right and d of l is given by m by 2 comma minus c. Is that right? Okay. So, this is now a point and this is now a line. So, let us again substitute. So, does it satisfy? So, question is, is y, sorry y is minus c, right? Is minus c equal to to so this is my equation 1 maybe i should write this one so 2 a x is m over 2 right that's all right i mean uh, mx uh, the line is minus b right so, is it equal to this? So, or is minus c equal to? Well, I'm just I'll just trans. Well, anyway, so let's be there. A m minus b or is b equal to a m plus c, which is exactly the same thing as equation 1, right. So, this is certainly true. 
right. So, the incidence property is satisfied by this mapping. Right. I will leave it is an exercise for you to verify the other properties, the above below condition. Okay. Other properties basically means the above below. The, the property 3, which is the point, sorry, uh, two lines meeting at a point, you know, will become two points lying on the line. So, that follows from this property anyway. So, that needs, need not be proved separately. So, prove the above below property strictly, okay. Uh, so, just from this, this, this mapping. So, what you know it at this point it just looks like some symbols you know some symbol pushing and somehow you know magically you know it this seems to work out and assuming that even the above below property holds. But what is you know a more intuitive thing? So, for the more intuitive thing let me draw your attention where this transform is coming from ok. So, consider um, ok let me go to a fresh page. So, consider this parabola y equal to x square. So, consider some point A on the x axis, this is x and this is y. So, A of course, so this point corresponds to A square. Okay. Now, this particular parabola, okay. Um, so, what is the equation? of the tangent at a a square. Can you work on it quickly? Do you remember enough of your analytical geometry? No, no, just tell me the answer, you know, I do not want to know how you calculate. So, what you are saying y equal to? 2 a x minus a square great. So, you, you remember it pretty well. Hmm? So, does it now ring any well? So, this transformation that the, the duality transform that I defined has this you know this point a b okay, is mapped to 2 a x minus b. Okay. So, at least you know why are we using this constant 2 here? I mean I could have simply written some something else. Why, why, why so this 2 is kind of explained by this 2. So, what are we saying? So, what we are saying is that if the point is on the parabola, okay, if the point is on the parabola, so the dual transform of that is what? The tangent itself, right. So, so what is the dual, dual of a a square? d of a a square by your definition it is y equal to 2 a x minus a square, right. So, it is not a coincidence. So, the tangent at a a square is the dual transform of the point, if the point is on the parabola. How about points not on the parabola? So, point not on the parabola, so the point could be either above or below, right. I could take A, I mean with the same x coordinate, okay. So, one possibility is the point is above, okay. The other possibility is the point is below, may not be on the parabola. Right. So, it is the same slope that is the way we have defined the dual transform, right. The slope remains same, the, the y intercept changes and if you calculate we will find that if the point is above the parabola, the y point is above the parabola, the dual transform is going to be parallel to this. 
So, okay, so first of all let me draw this to this tangent. This is the tangent if the point was on the on the parabola. So, for a point above the parabola you can show that the duality transform the dual transform will be below the parabola and not only that it will be shifted by something like so this is a comma b see it is not b minus a square okay so this point will map to something that is b minus a square likewise the point below the parabola will be mapped to a line above the parabola again with this kind of a the, the intercept will be so you just take the signed difference and that will be what it is okay so this is the geometric interpretation of this dual transform so when you go to higher dimensions what happens can you guess what should be the dual transform if we use the same kind of idea for the dual transform so then you are talking about a so in higher dimensions okay you then talk about a paraboloid okay so let me not use y and x but let me use let us say x1 x2 all the way up to xd these are my in, di in d dimensions i have these as the coordinates so then my paraboloid is defined as again some constant okay Oh, sorry, what am I? I'm not. Let me not. Not not the shifted parabola, just the parabola. Y equal to x square. So then, if you again look at the slopes, you take the partial derivatives with respect to all the coordinates, right? So the del x d by del x i is two x i, right? So then can you guess what should be the uh, dual transform in the higher dimensions? So d of the point now point in uh, so it is a d dimension point. So we are talking about uh, a 1, a 2, a 3 up to a d. So can you guess what this should be the dual transform of this point? right 2 a 1 x 1 plus 2 a 2 x 2 same thing plus oh sorry what am I saying just a moment um, yeah I have to write that ooh, ooh. So this is what it will work out. So again, the geometric interpretation remains the same even in the higher dimensions. Why use this? Well, the same thing. If you want to compute the, so we have not studied about let us say constructing convex hulls in three dimensions or higher dimensions. But what this says is that if you know how to construct the convex hull in three dimensions, you can use the same algorithm to compute the intersection of half spaces in three dimensions and in higher dimensions. Why use the paraboloid? So this is a specific transform that satisfies the you know the properties that we mentioned. So this is one kind of transformation that satisfies all those properties that we desire from the duality transform. There are also other kinds of transformations that work. Okay. There are at least uh, I, I know of about three or four other kinds of transformations. Okay, that satisfies those properties, and you could use any of those transformations. Okay, such that. Uh, you could go from this convex hull to intersections okay because all those 
transformation satisfy the basic properties that we discussed. Okay. This is this paraboloid transform. I'll I'll just give you another nice uh, property of this paraboloid transform. Not just for this thing, but we will be able to make use of it in in some 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 even more non non intuitive uh, applications. Okay. Um, but just note one thing that uh, here the transformation is not defined with respect to uh, in two dimensions with respect to vertical lines because the above below does not hold there. So, there is some singularity or let us say that one in the dual space of lines, one line the vertical lines basically have no counterparts. Okay. Similarly, for any of the other transformation, uh, I am not getting into the details of those, you know there will be one singularity point and there is a basic fundamental geometric limitation why these transformation will have one point of singularity. Okay. So, especially if you are familiar with projective spaces, this, this is what this is also one kind of projective space actually. Right. Okay, so, let me talk about another nice property of this paraboloid transform. Right. Uh, okay. so, okay. so, here is my parabola, okay. here is uh, So, I am drawing the tangent at a comma a square, this is my tangent at a comma a square. Let us call this distance which is this distance I am calling d. What is distance d? So, I am looking at the tangent at a comma a square and I have I have a point um, I have a point b. So, this is b comma b square and I am looking at the distance of the parabola at b comma b square the vertical distance. Okay, to this tangent, which I am calling D. Right. Now D is equal to how much? B minus a square. Yeah, yeah, right. Whatever B minus a whole square or B minus a square. Okay. So this is this is just you know follows from this formula. So this thing can be interpreted as the following. So if this point, so I am talking about two points now, you know one is this a, a square and another is b, b square. So, if you look at the projection of the points on the x axis, okay, namely this a and b, okay, the distance between this okay, is b minus a, right. Okay. So, this is distance in the uh, projected or this is the projected distance on x axis or whatever distance ok sorry.
So, as if you know I had just projected those points from the parabola to the x axis. So, that is the distance. So, that distance square is equal to d. Right? So, what it says is that further the point if I take another point c Okay. So, another point C basically and I look at well I mean so again the vertical distance of C comma C square to this to this line. Okay. So, it is sort of directly proportional to the projected distance on the x axis right. So, we will just remember it as the following you know if if the distance uh, uh, on the on the x axis between two points is more the vertical distance that you obtain from the parabola to this point is also grows. It grows as some square, but essentially it is proportional. The larger this b is, the larger is the distance. Okay. So, in, in future, you know, when we talk about things like, you know, uh, finding closest neighbors and discuss about Voronoi diagrams, okay, we will see that there is a very close link using this transformation between what is called the three, di three dimension convex hulls okay, and Voronoi diagrams. So, like we could get these for free that you know uh, this 2 for 1 deal right you know uh, convex hulls and intersection of half planes. It turns out that there is a very similar relation between you know a 2 D Voronoi diagram and a 3 D convex hull. Okay. Right now, I will just leave it at that and I am only drawing your attention to this property. Only this property will be used to and and this this works for any kind of so i have i have moved from x the the projection is along x right and the parabola is a two dimensional curve so if i take the set of points from x and lift it to this parabola which is one dimension higher okay so essentially what i am saying that in general if i take these points on d minus 1 dimension and project it to a parabola which is a d dimensional paraboloid okay then i have some kind of relation between the distance in the d minus 1 Okay, and the vertical distance from this, from this uh, parabola uh, to the to the tangent at, at this point. So when you are, if you are looking for, so I am given this point A, you know this point, and I am trying to find the closest point. So that has clearly some relation between this, uh, you know, uh, relation uh, in terms of the vertical distance of this point. So, whatever is the distance, you know, distance between A and B or distance between A and C can be captured, at least the relative distances can be captured by this vertical distance from the paraboloid. Okay. So, that leads to, so we will I'll, we'll do it more formally later on, this is the exact one to one correspondence between Voronoi diagrams and convex hulls, but with one dimension cap. So, 3 D hulls and 2 D Voronoi diagrams, that kind of thing. And therefore, you know, even when you study what is called the structural properties of uh, Voronoi diagrams, that follows from the convex hull in one higher dimension. So this really sort of simplifies a lot of things that people study about Voronoi diagrams. Right? In general, what we'll study, we'll go beyond this and we'll talk about what are called arrangements of lines and arrangements of hyperplanes. So that has basically, so we'll all pull it together later and show you how they all correspond. Right? So for now, this is all I will you know, talk about uh, duality. Any questions at this point? So, in the, uh, the, in the higher dimension, you have this point transforming the lines and vice versa, but what about faces? You just, you just, there is no transformation for faces? I mean. No, no, so the, the transformation is defined for all dimensions, right? No, uh, but uh, it is only point going to lines. Points going to lines and lines going to points. Like No, no. So essentially, this is a point hyperplane transformation, right? So if you are talking about a d-dimensional space, okay. you are mapping it to another d-dimensional space. One is the I am calling the primal dim, uh, space, and it's called the dual space. And so this particular duality mapping is a point hyperplane transformation. There are other kinds of transformations people talk about, okay. but uh, for the kind of problems we are looking into, we are this point hyperplane transformation is the is the one that is most important to us or very useful to us. So, this preserves the dimension in some sense, although they are two different spaces. Okay. Always remember the points, the space of points and space of lines, they are not the same space. Okay. It is the dimension of the space is the same, but you know we are not talking about the same space. It is one is the space of points and there is a space of lines or space of points and space of 
uh, hyper, hyper planes. Right. The other kinds of transformations where did where you know this this preservation of dimension is not necessary. Okay, the things like when you go from segments, uh, which which are actually see it's it's basically you know how many coordinates do you require, how many parameters do you require to capture an object. So if you think about a line segment, well, how many parameters do you require to capture a line segment? Two points, right? Which basically means two coordinates each. So it is like four. It's actually a four-dimensional object. Okay. So there is actually a transform transformation between uh, lines and uh, some kind of curves in the five dimensions called Plucker coordinates. So there are various such things people have studied in geometry, and some of them we you know are useful for you know doing computational geometry. So since I am talking about already 4 and 5 dimension, I will spend the rest of the lecture today and probably the next lecture also, uh, which I have you know I've sort of been postponing for a while is talk a little bit about you know how lower bounds are derived in, in for geometric problems. Hmm? Okay. So let us use one, uh, one running example and uh, so, okay. so right now let us worry about this problem, let us call it problem uh, So, if I am given a point set like uh, sorry okay, a set of elements which have the following values 0 0.3, 1 1.1, 1 1.56, you know 1.1, 2.8. Okay. So, this set of elements clearly has a repetition because these two have the same values. So, the answer so it is a decision problem. Okay. So, decision problem which has a yes no answer. So, this uh, if, if you consider this particular instance, then the answer is a it is no, right? It is not unique. On the other hand, you know, if I change it to 1.15, then the answer is yes, all elements are unique. Uh, of course, these elements can be drawn from all kinds of universe. Okay, so if the element suppose x i s are from this set, what would you do? What is the easiest way? Of, hmm? Right. So it's the easiest way to do it is basically hash. Right. So, I have an array of size n corresponding to the value of each element I hash and after I hash I find out. Uh, so, essentially indirect addressing right. So, with indirect addressing it takes uh, order n time. Fine. What if I do this. Hmm? 
Oui. Well, at least I made you think. <laughs> you can hash, fine, but after hashing, first of all, when you, when you hash, there is one problem about hashing that people always forget. How do you initialize? There is a space, in his, uh, hashing is about using some space, right? And that space somehow needs to be initialized. So, if you are hashing in n square space, that is a problem. Okay, you are going to use n locations. So, what when you use n locations, what are you going to do? Well, so, you are getting into some somewhat non trivial things, right? You know, there should be should or should not be collisions, you know, how many collisions will be there. So, well, I mean, if you have done a course with me on algorithms, you may have someone would have blotted out, okay, use uh, universal hashing, right? Does it ring a bell? Okay, I am not even going to get into those kind of, you know, uh, scenarios, but I, th I, I claim that there is an even simpler way to think about it. No, no, no. So, well, I mean, so that you can forget about parabolas, you know, n to the power 5. Someone, someone should blurt out the answer by now. Do not think always about linear time solutions. I am not, I am not saying that you have to give me linear time solution, but what would be a natural way of solving sort this problem? Yeah, right, I wanted to hear that. So, if you sort them, then of course, uh, any repetition will be in consecutive location. After sorting, it can be checked in linear time, right. So, now if I want, can I sort these elements quickly? Huh? No, come on. Right, you know the range, right, and it is a poly no, polynomial range. So, what do you do? Yeah, well, I mean, you call it various things, I call it radix sort, right. So, radix sort means for any range which is polynomial, you can do it in order n time. Are you familiar with this? You just run your, your buckets from 1 through n and you repeat c times and it has to be a stable sort to be able to apply radix sort. Right? I do not know, people always forget about radix sort, I do not know why. I mean, people remember merge sort, insertion sort, you know, all those you know useless things probably, not merge sort, but you know in insertion sort, but somehow people never think about radix sort. I mean, I emphasize so much of in you know, sort when I teach algorithms and still you know people, well, anyway, people who have done the course. So, you cannot do radix sort unless the sorting is stable. We can take it offline in the class. No, 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 no. So, radix sort is not a sorting algorithm per se. Radix sort is a, is a high level sorting algorithm that uses a basic sorting algorithm, right. So, that Sorting algorithm must be, must be yes. Okay, so uh, order in time is x i is polynomial, you know. Okay, but what if uh, okay, suddenly I have just <laughs> blasted, right? And no finite, this thing absolutely infinite set now. Okay. Yeah, so okay. Now you can sort it. Yes. You, sorting is reasonable, sure, and it will give you that whatever the sorting takes. So essentially, what you are saying is that yes, I can certainly solve element uniqueness in the time that I require to sort. Right? Question is, can we do better? Right? So uh, element uniqueness, let's call it E U, is reducible to sorting. That is what we are saying. So, which means that the lower bound of element uniqueness should also apply to sorting, right. Ok, 
Okay, but then we are actually interested in the lower bound of elementary magnetism, not about sorting. Okay. So, we cannot apply the sorting lower bound to element uniqueness, but we can do it the other way around. Okay. Now, all the lower bounds, not all the lower bounds, the lower bound, the famous lower bound or the most commonly known lower bound for sorting. assumes a certain model of computation. And what is that? Comparison tree, right. So, what is a comparison tree model? Well, I mean since it is not a decision problem, it is a it is it's, it's more than that. So, I am using the word comparison tree rather than a you know decision tree. So, you compare some elements x i x j okay, and branch according to you know less than or you know some such thing right. And depending on this thing you keep doing it until you know you get your leaves right leaves each corresponding to a specific ordering okay and uh, therefore number of leaves should be greater than or equal to n factorial right a leaf cannot have two possible orderings because i mean for my argument you know i am going to use greater than or equal to i mean greater than or equal to also means equal to right greater than or equal to so so number of leaves is greater than this okay and this implies that the longest path in the tree it at least log of this right. So, longest path which is about so this is your basic argument for the lower bound for sorting and So, the, the, the comparison uh, and we do not actually count anything else right you know. Uh, so, the comparison tree model only counts comparisons only counts comparisons. So, this tree is only to count comparisons if you are doing any some uh, something some additions you know some uh, other things like you know assignments you know whatever it is other kinds of operations are not even being accounted for here. But, it says that you are basically using comparisons to sort you are stuck with this bound right? and this is something that I have been alluding to a couple of times that you know why should one only limit oneself to comparisons. Okay. So, what is comparison? Comparison you can think about like you know I take two numbers x i okay, minus x j that is basically my comparison right. So, this is a special case of a inequality, a linear inequality where both coefficients are 1, right. So, a, a more uh, general a general inequality could be this could be another test you know it is it is more general than comparison, but it is still linear right. And why even have 2 x i x j you know 
एक्स जाए एक्स आई एक्स जे एक्स एल में भी ओके आई कैन ब्रिंग इन मोर डायमेंशन सो नाउ इट इज लुकिंग लाइक नॉट लाइक जस्ट कंपेरिंग टू एलिमेंट्स बट इन सम डायमेंशन ओके वी आर इवेल्यूटिंग दिस इन इक्वालिटी और इन अदर वर्ड्स आर वी अब ए हाइपर प्लेन और बिलो ए हाइपर प्लेन दैट्स बेसिकली द काइंड ऑफ डिसीजन सो द मोमेंट आई आई डू दिस काइंड ऑफ आई सी दिस इज द दिस इज ऑपरेशन दैट आई एम अलाउड टू डू इन इन वन स्टेप ओके द आर्ग्यूमेंट दैट वी यूज प्रीवियसली इज नॉट गोइंग टू गोइंग टू फॉल ए पार्ट बिकॉज यू नो इफ इफ यू हैव डन द आर्ग्यूमेंट रिगरसली यू नो इट इट वॉज ओनली अबाउट दिस कंपेरिजन ओके so somehow we need to you know redress that and you know see if actually those that lower bound holds in this kind of a model okay right now we are not talking about sorting we are talking about element uniqueness okay. so the model for element uniqueness oh sorry um, is what i called a an uh, a linear decision tree so decision because i am look i am i am we are we are discussing a decision problem namely uh, the element uniqueness is yes or no linear because i am allowed to use only linear uh, inequalities right so at any node okay i evaluate some linear inequality okay and again depending on less than or greater than or equal to a branch in the end in the leaf nodes the answer is either a yes or a no right maybe yes 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 okay no 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 etc how many leaf nodes should there be this is not sorting how many leaf nodes should there, should there be not clear right <laughs> okay so certain num certain number of leaf nodes you know hopefully some kind of so any algorithm that uses uh, linear decision uh, sorry any any algorithm that is using linear inequalities to make the to decide on the next step can be captured by this model which i am calling the linear decision tree model okay so there is this uh, problem where which is element uniqueness and there is this pro then there, there is this model which is a linear decision tree model and we have to somehow link up this problem and this this tree somehow the structure of this tree like in the case of sorting we linked up the problem of sorting with some kind of structural properties of the tree right that had at least n factorial leaves okay here we can't even argue about that because it is some kind of a decision problem okay we can't say there n factorial n factorial uh, permutations or something so we need to be able to draw some linkages between the problem and this tree that's how lower bounds are going to work i mean work out let me also just make a small remark here i am discussing currently linear decision tree okay but similar arguments of course with you know more you need some more tools to be able to handle that you can you know you, you can model what is called a an 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 algebraic decision tree where the basic inequality may not be linear but it may be higher degree maybe degree 2 degree 3 whatever okay so those are called fixed degree uh, i'm just mentioning it fixed degree algebraic decision tree okay so that's one variation other variation is even more general okay why even fix the degree you know i can actually when i do computation okay i can raise you know a number to any power that i want why should we be constrained and i can raise it to uh, any power by double, by repeated squaring which means that you know in in very small amount of time i can really sort of blow up the degree right i can go from x to x square to x square square x square square so in in i steps i can compute x to the power 2 to the power i okay so why should we limit ourselves to only fixed degree you know i can i can actually compute x to the power n very quickly in polynomial time or whatever right so then uh, then you talk about you know what is called the most general is called arithmetic computation tree okay. 
So, I am not going to discuss these variations, but it is somewhat closely linked to the discussion that we will have. Right. So, today let me just talk about the problem space. Okay. So, the problem space that we have, the input is this, this tuple, this n tuple x 1 to x n. So, now for a moment just think about the input as a single point in n dimensions. We have an n tuple, okay. I am thinking I'm, I can consider this n tuple, okay, as a point, as one point in n dimension space. Right. So, what do we gain by that? Not much, but actually it makes, although it looks complicated, it makes you know thinking somewhat cleaner. So, in that high dimensional n dimensional space, okay, certain points are yes points, right, which are where, where all elements are unique, all coordinates are unique. Some of these points, okay, they are not all unique and therefore, they are the no answers. Right. So, in my space of what is the space I am talking about, I am actually taking you to r to the power n. Right. So, in r to the power n, Okay, some subset, say W, okay, contains all the yes answers, okay, and the complement are the no answers. So, whatever my algorithm is and if I am modeling it as a as a decision tree, in the end any point that I input, any point that is in R sub n eventually should end up in, the, in, the, in, in a leaf node. If it is a yes instance, it should end up in a leaf node that says yes. If it is a no instance where not elements all elements are unique, it should end up in a leaf node corresponding to a to this uh, you know to the to the no this thing or the label of the leaf node. Okay. Uh, just to you know, give you a very simple example, you know, in in just two dimensions, okay, how does this space look? What is the space? Uh, or what what is the set of points corresponding to yes, and what's the set of points corresponding to no? Yeah, right. So that's it, right? This is my no and this is basically w right so in the plane if you're talking about a plane you can you can visualize this as you go to higher dimensions okay you have to basically look at the intersection of these half planes okay so there's some uh, half planes or you call them half hyperplanes you know so hyper so you have to look at the hyperplanes x i equal to x j, right? i not equal to j. So, in n dimensions, these are the hyperplanes, these are, these are the hyperplanes that will contain those points that will correspond to the no answer, right? i not equal to j. And you have to look at what is called essentially the arrangement of these hyperplanes in this n dimensional space, okay? So, union of all the points that lie on the hyperplane correspond to the no answer and the complement of this corresponds to the yes. yes answer. Any point that is not on any of these hyperplane, this is an n dimensional point. So, if that n dimensional point does not lie in the union of these hyperplanes, it means that all coordinates are unique. Okay. So, so let us stop today okay, and we will continue with that next time. Okay.